Okay, Doug, we'll start with you. Can you just give us a brief overview of patents and uh, a process an inventor might go through when filing a patent on their idea? I'm glad you said brief because uh, <laughs> this, this could go on for, for quite a while. I'll try to give you kind of a 10,000 foot yep. uh, approach here. But the biggest thing, when you look at an invention or, or you know, what you've come up with, three things that you, that you want to look at is it new, useful, and unobvious. Well, the new and the useful part of that are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, new is basically not already out there in ide identical form to what you've come up with. Useful, um, pretty much of a no-brainer there. If it wasn't useful, you wouldn't have come up with it. But, um, the obviousness part uh, is where a lot of times you get tripped up. Um, and it used to be when somebody would come to us with an idea with, with a new invention, we would go out and automatically conduct a search. Well, a few years ago, the USPTO changed from a first, uh, first to file, or sorry, first to invent system to a first inventor to file system, which all of a sudden created a race to the patent office. So uh, a lot of times now we'll kind of skip that first step, which was always to conduct the search and jump right into filing a provisional patent application to at least get your uh, idea on record with the patent office. But typically the first step you want to do is look and see if it is patentable and, and to, to do that you'll conduct a search. A lot of times that's something you can do yourself. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uh, has a very good search engine uh, that you can search there. Google has, with everything, they have an area called Google Patent and you can search uh, there uh, very easily with certain keywords and uh, just see what, what, what else is out there that's maybe close to your invention. Um, once you've satisfied yourself that yes, it looks like it's going to be patentable, you can go on uh, to filing an application. And that's where you have a few choices of what you can file. I mentioned already the provisional patent application, which is essentially uh, not the one that will mature into a patent, but gives you a, basically a one-year period of time, gives you your filing date, a serial number, you can put patent pending or patent applied for on drawings, prototypes, marketing literature, whatever. Um, but it gives you that one year period then to, to test the market, see if it's something that's going to be viable, see if it's something people are going to want, and then make a determination at the end of that period of time whether or not to proceed with filing a regular application. And that, that regular application is what will proceed forward and, and eventually mature into a patent. There's also a, a kind of a, a different type of patent application called a design patent application that basically just covers the overall ornamental appearance of the invention. So you can get them, uh, you can do both a utility or a regular application and a design application, um, but the, the design coverage that you have is a little n more narrow than what you would get for a regular application because it, if you tweak the, the appearance of it a little bit, you can get around a, a previous uh, uh, patent or other art that's out there. Uh, once the process starts, you have uh, basically what's called prosecution. You're back and forth with the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, essentially negotiating the breadth of coverage of whatever claims you have in, in the patent application. And the claims are essentially the legal portion of the patent application that define, uh, similar to a uh, meets and bounds description of property, uh, very archaic. Uh, language great for people who write, write run-on sentences because um, it's all essentially one sentence, but you're describing what your uh, patent actually covers and uh, is very important. One word in a claim that's unnecessary can mean the difference between infringement and non-infringement. So it's very, it's often described as one of the most difficult legal instruments to write because of that. So. Um, and once, once you've satisfied the patent office that you have something that uh, is patentable and the claims are not overly broad, uh, then you could get uh, a patent that would issue. So from a very high level, that's kind of the process that you go through. And that typically takes anywhere from, we used to say one to three years. It seems like now that it's maybe probably closer to two to four years. Uh, so. so just quickly, if you could talk a little bit too about um, like domestic and foreign. That's a very important distinction there. <clears throat> Patents by nature are territorial. So if you get a patent in the US, that gives you rights in the US only. You do not have rights in any other countries aside from the US. 
and it gives you what's called a negative right. It's the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling your invention. May not necessarily give you the right to make your own invention because you could potentially infringe someone else's rights. And I always, the example I always use is if you come up with a uh, chair, you have a seating surface, four legs, and you get a patent on that, then you have the right to exclude others from producing that. But somebody else could come along and, and add a back support to that and get a patent on that improvement. So they have four legs, seating surface, and a back support. Now neither of you can produce the one with the back on it because they, you know, their, their patent covers the four legs, seating surface, and the back. Yours covers the four legs and the seating surface. So at that point, you're left with a situation where you ultimately will end up cross-licensing each other so that you can both produce the new and improved one. Right. And then somebody comes along and creates the one with the arms on it and you have a new situation. <laughs> but, so, you know, you get a, get a patent in the U.S., it's good in the U.S. Um, we typically work with a network of attorneys throughout the world uh, in just about every country uh, in order to apply in other countries. Um, so each, if you have a, a market in Europe or if you have a market in Mexico uh, or Japan, China, wherever, you may want to look at uh, getting a patent in one of those territories as well. Or if you have a potential uh, competitor that may try to produce there and import, um, then you could also apply there, which you know, adds a deterrent effect to that um, from them trying to bring in. But again, if, you, if it's something, somebody could try to make it abroad and bring it here, if you've got a U.S. patent, you could pre prevent them to do, from doing that, but they can't make it, use it, and sell it. Uh, or they can make it and use it and sell it outside the U.S. if you only have a U.S. patent. But the downside to that is the international stuff is extremely uh, costly. So right. I mean, you're, all the uh, costs for prosecution in each of those essentially starts multiplying uh, for each jurisdiction. So again, you want to have some either uh, market or competitor in those right. areas. And I forgot to say to you guys, if you have things to add to, please feel free. This is just kind of an open conversation. Everybody comes at this from a different perspective, which we do on purpose. So did you guys have anything you wanted to add to that at all? I mean, I think the only thing I would say is that it's really important from your marketing perspective um, to look at what countries you plan to patent in because the costs when you're starting a company are pretty con considerable and patent expenses are fairly expensive when you start to prosecute in internationally. Um, we have a number of patents where we're in maybe five to seven countries and the cost can easily escalate over $100,000. So when you're at the earliest stage of the company, you want to be thinking about where do we really want to protect our intellectual property uh, because it ultimately can be a reason that the company fails because they don't have the resources then or they've deployed the resources to protect the intellectual property that they should have been using to actually commercialize their product. Right. I would say, like, this is what is echoed every time that I, I learn something new every time we do this. The one thing, though, that seems to be constant is get the experts involved early. Um, because, so just to summarize, right, so the clock's ticking pretty quickly, or maybe it wasn't before. And there is a wide world of things that, that you may or may not understand. So don't be afraid to go talk to the experts, especially here in Northwest Ohio. They're usually pretty great about you know, genuinely wanting to help because they want to see your business succeed. So, um, and I, I know in my work with Doug and with Stephen that obviously Stephen's position is a little bit different, but, but they do genuinely want to see these businesses succeed. So get them involved early, make sure you're on the right track early because it's harder to fix on the don't, back end. Don't be yeah. afraid to use the resources that are available because I mean, they, yep. you know, they can come talk to you, they can yep. typically, um, I saw Phil walk in somewhere, but, um, you know, there's office hours that um, you know, hold out here, and I know Steve probably talks to people all the time. Yep. Um, just, it doesn't hurt to ask, and yep. then, you know, oftentimes you, the, the clock doesn't start until later. You know, you, yep. you'll get people that are willing to help up front. Yep. And you really don't have to enter the national phase until about 30 months into the process. So, I mean, that's really where you would start to incur significant costs internationally. Um, if you go the provisional to a PCT, um, it buys you time to be able to actually figure out where your target markets are um, before you begin to incur those costs. 
The only thing I was really directing the conversation toward, though, was making sure that you actually have a market yeah. where you're trying to protect it. A lot of people just say, I want to be in Europe, I want to be in the US, I want to be in China, and they're just looking at, I think, the population, um, and they might necessarily miss a, company, a country that has a high obesity rate, where their product actually would be a really good fit. Um, for example, in Japan, so you really point. need to understand the market. Yeah, good.